Greetings and salutations, friends! Uh, today we are going to do a little bit of an unusual lore video. More of a discussion rather than necessarily a lore video in and of itself. Because we're going to be talking about a piece of 30k lore. Horus Heresy lore, more specifically, The Last Church by Graham McNeil. This is a piece that is, um... <laughs> Highly controversial, shall we say, and the fact that it has created such a divided opinion and so many um, impassioned arguments on both sides, well, on the one hand, it, uh, it certainly makes some interesting points about the subject matter in and of itself, does it not? But there is also a fan animation currently in production about The Last Church. They are currently trying to raise some cash over on Kickstarter, and they have contacted me to give it a look. And seeing as this is something that I have been wanting to cover and discuss for a while, I figured this was the perfect opportunity. So I will be using some of the assets from that fan animation animation in the background here, and if you like what you see, then do consider heading over to the Kickstarter page, link in the description below, and give it a closer look. Now without further ado, let's get into the last church, shall we? So there are several points in here that are quite interesting from a 40k and of course 30k law standpoint, but it is also a rather interesting theological argument. Now Graham McNeil when he wrote this basically said that he wished to present the arguments of the both sides without necessarily picking a winner, so to say. So he wanted the conclusion to be relatively open-ended, which is what I think an author should be doing whenever he is approaching a subject matter like this, this being obviously a, again, quite a uh, divisive topic on the idea of religion, not only in 30k and 40k, but also in our current world, since both parties, Uriah and The Stranger, make some... Um, claims and statements, shall we say. And one of the two characters that we will be following through this short story is the priest of this last church on terror, a person by the name of Uriah Olather. And we find him as he is closing up shop for the night. His midnight sermons had apparently once been quite popular in these parts, but on this particular night no one had come out to hear it. Uriah attributes this to fear of the dark, which... <laughs> I guess midnights are quite bright around these parts for some reason, but hey, details. He then goes on to link in the fear of the dark with the Thunder Warriors, and how the dark was seen as a time of blood raiding, and monstrous engines ascending on plumes of fire. I don't know if this is simply a tortured metaphor, or if this is suggesting that the Thunder Warriors specialized in night actions? I mean, Considering their biology and their hardware, it wouldn't be impossible, surely. But the metaphor does fall a little bit on its face because, well, nighttime was not a time of blood and battle and fire, because it's damn difficult to fight during the night. <laughs> It seems obvious, but, well, it's only until relatively recently in modern days that we have started seeing nighttime operation become more and more common, and even then, only really for countries with the technological know-how and training that you require to operate during the, well, flat-out fairly difficult conditions of the night. And you may think I'm being overly pedantic here, and yes, to a degree, I probably am, but... When I reread this short story, it really stood out to me how the Thunder Warriors were presented. It starts by linking them to the dark and fear, to blood and fire. And Uriah then goes on to say that all the despots and tyrants had been swept aside by their might and terror was now at peace for the first time in, well, God Emperor only knows how long. Possibly for the first time ever, potentially. Uriah then goes on to think to himself that surely a world united in peace should have been a good thing, but even so he is disturbed by it, and can find no comfort in the thought. 
And this is why this little bit of pedantry is actually important, because of course Uriah doesn't find any comfort in it. He has already painted a picture in our minds of the Thunder Warriors as raiders, as spillers of blood, of bringers of fire, as, in essence, villains. And of course it does make a certain degree of sense for Uriah to think this way, for reasons that we will learn later, but it is also important to clarify that this is Uriah's view, and a highly one-sided one as well, as we will get to see again further on. And the setup doesn't end there. Uriah goes on to think about how fearful people sought comfort in his sermons, how he was able to provide them with a measure of solace. And he is even shown in the story to be carrying a small, weak, guttering light as he wanders the halls. Uh, quote, fearful that this last illumination would be snuffed out. This may again seem inconsequential at first, but Uriah is, quite subtly, honestly, painted as the good character here. He is the one that provides comfort to the fearful, and he is protecting this last little spark of illumination. We are being primed to like this character, and make no mistake, this is no accident of prose. The author even said so himself that he wanted Uriah to be the more likeable of the two characters. Furthermore, Uriah also introduces us to a timepiece, a wondrous mechanical clock that Uriah apparently stole in his youth from a rich person living in a mansion with several other wondrous timepieces, a place now destroyed by the wars. This not-too-subtle war is bad is then followed by a prophecy that the clock will ring when doomsday is at hand. Already the first time reading this, I was like, ah, it's going to be ringing at the end of this story, isn't it? <sighs> you know, it's called foreshadowing for a reason. It's supposed to be subtle, like a shadow. Not obvious, like a drunken elephant trying to force fuck a piano, but again, details. Then our stranger arrives, and introduces himself, when asked to do so, as Revelation. I suppose I should be grateful that he didn't name himself Illumination, uh, Reason, or <laughs> he who is right, motherfucker. The hints are quite clear from the very get-go, so we shan't bother with the pretense. The stranger is the Emperor, come personally, for sentimental reasons apparently, to this last church at the head of his warriors, carrying torches. Again, foreshadowing via flame this time. Well, I mean, it's also raining outside and it's the middle of the night and torches seem like a poor choice in the far distant future, but it looks cool so we shall forgive the melodrama. Uriah then swiftly continues, hitting us over the head with the story conditioning, by thinking to himself that this stranger is dangerous, a man of violence, and likens him to a rabid dog on a fraying leash. He does, however, stop just short of summoning a dance troupe of beetles and bugs to sing In the Dark of the Night from Anastasia. Look it up, by the way, it's awesome on the evil cartoon song that's better is Savages. Anywho, now that we are at long last done pissing in the well, we can get into the meat of things, as the Emperor and Uriah have themselves a discussion. And it is a rather interesting one as well, so we'll break it up by points. The first of which is an attempt to provide proof of the divine. Uriah has a reproduction of a majestical fresco, and he asks the Emperor, surely only an artist moved by the divine could create such beauty. A point the Emperor quickly dismisses, art needs no divinity to inspire it, and this should be amply proven by our own godless age. Art is everywhere, and to a standard and quality rarely if ever before seen in human history, and it is technology, not spirituality, that allows for it. And Uriah surrenders this one quite easily by simply just saying that you believe what you want and I believe what I want. <laughs> we'll be seeing more of that one. The next point is about faith. The Emperor says that soon his forces will arrive and tear down the last church on Terra. Though, of course, he says that, oh yes, you surely know that the Emperor will come one day and tear your church down instead of being like, hi, 
I've come to demolish the place. <laughs> a little bit straightforward, I suppose. And Uriah responds by saying he doesn't care. It won't change his faith. To which the Emperor responds, Faith, a willing belief in the unbelievable without proof. Which is about as good a definition of faith as I've ever heard, really. And Uriah responds by saying that that is precisely what makes faith so powerful. It does not require proof, merely belief. And he is right. That is what makes faith so very powerful. But it is also what makes faith so very, very dangerous and destructive at the very same time. Because, of course, this line of reason can be used to justify and legitimize literally anything. Once you have created a doctrine whose core tenet is, you don't need proof, you only need to believe, then said doctrine has no limits beyond those it places upon itself, and by extension, those limits also only apply for as long as the doctrine says they do. One of the funnier examples of this would of course be found in Islam, where you can have up to four wives. Unless of course you're the prophet, he had thirteen. This was then justified in Surah 33 verse 50, where it is made clear that the Prophet can have as many wives as Allah wants him to have, which coincidentally is <laughs> the same number as the ones the Prophet wanted. Hmm. And this is quite beautiful, so allow me to quote you part of the reasoning here. Quoting, This only for thee and not for the believers. Literally, one rule for me, another for thee. <laughs> uh, I recommend looking up the circumstances around it. He was at one point caught um, being intimate with another woman, and of course, then they were like, hey, uh, this, this goes against the teaching. Surely you can't do this. And he's like, oh, hold on. I seem to be getting a direct message from an angel here. <laughs> And it just so happens, he says it's fine. <laughs> it's, it's, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty good. I like it. It's just sheer balls on the man. I gotta respect it. Absolutely. And, of course, at least you think me biased. Let me take another, um, example of convenience from Christianity. The Crusades. Now, don't get me wrong, I personally think that militarily they were entirely justifiable, or, well, the first one at the very least. The other ones, um, well, individual basis, but the First Crusade, just like the Prophet's urge to bang in multiple chicks, I consider to be entirely justifiable. But here's the kicker. Christianity does have that whole thou shalt not kill thing, and that does seem to be a pretty ironclad no-no on the whole organized killing front. But fortunately, it turns out that what God really meant was, thou shall not kill Christians. <laughs> Phew, dodged a bullet on that one, eh? And of course, I'm not saying that faith and belief are inherently bad. My point is that whilst faith and belief are not inherently bad, neither are they inherently good. And far too often they are presented as such. It is my opinion that virtually anything taken to the extreme is almost always a bad thing, and we should not consider faith, for faith's sake, to be a virtue, because just believing in something because is nothing more than slavery by another name, bondage to a doctrine in which you have little to no say, and which effortlessly changes to suit the rulers at the top. The Emperor, however, takes it one step further, and states that faith is dangerous. Politics has slain its thousands, but religion has slain its millions, he says. A turn of phrase, of course, but even so, I understand his point while I cannot, however, agree with Big E on this one, since we simply don't know. Sure, religion has been one of, if not indeed, the leading cause of conflict for pretty much as long as there has been people, and some faiths in particular have been savage to a degree that beggars belief. But humans are complex creatures, and rarely, if ever, will you find a conflict sparked and driven entirely by one thing. 
The First Crusade, for example, was started as a relief effort for the Byzantines, and religion was more along the lines of a convenient rallying point rather than the prime purpose. Even Islam, a religion which in the speech of Khalid ibn al-Walid, the Sword of Islam, basically declared all out war on all people that were not Muslim, we can question whether or not this was done out of pure religious zeal, or because, at the time, the Muslims wanted to be at war with pretty much everyone because they were winning and they saw great gains in doing so. Raiding, taxes, and general increase in one's servants and population. Well, these are powerful motivators that are not purely religious. And therefore, we can question whether or not these various conflicts had a purely religious basis, or if even ever a purely religious conflict ever existed in the first place. If anything, the Aztecs would probably be the closest to such conflict, because well, their beliefs were uh, on the rather more extreme end of the spectrum, both in terms of violence and zeal. But again, we don't really have any precise way of knowing, we haven't kept track, unsurprisingly, and so this is one particular dick measuring contest that uh, we will never really see a conclusion of. And so saying whether or not one thing or another, be it religion or politics, has caused the most death in human history is really kind of a moot point and will always end up being somewhat hyperbolic because, again, we simply can't know. Uriah, however, does not make this point. He instead chooses to simply take offence, and threatens to end the conversation then and there. <laughs> Good old-fashioned outrage it is, then. How dare you offend my beliefs! As if the very act of believing in something somehow makes it sacrosanct. Wonderful example of the whole why we should not consider faith for faith's sake a virtue. And I would probably have preferred it if the Emperor simply just looked him in the eyes and went, I don't care if you're offended. If you take issues with my statement, refute it or go cry in a corner. But for some reason, presumably he simply wants to continue the conversation, the Emperor just surrenders the point. It is remarkable how effective offence can be, isn't it? <laughs> Small wonder that it's still in such extensive use today. Anywho, moving on, Uriah then presents his church's raison d'etre to the Emperor, the holy relic, the very keystone of Uriah's faith and the reason for the existence of the temple. A rock. No, oh, wait, excuse me. A magical rock. Piggy is not impressed, and asks why the rock is holy, and apparently a blind and deaf man was out walking the mountains by himself, as blind and deaf men are wont to do, and then came a storm. The man tried to hurry back to the village, but he couldn't reach it in time and sought shelter. That is when a lightning bolt struck nearby, and the man was miraculously cured of his deafness and blindness as he heard the lightning and saw the visage of the creator. And due to the magical healing properties of this miracle, presumably being attributed to the large rock unearthed by the lightning strike, the church was then constructed on that very selfsame site. This then attracted thousands of pilgrims that came to bathe in the waters that pippled up from beneath a spring revealed by the rock. Convenient that. To say that this story smells a bit fishy would be an insult to aquatic creatures everywhere, but that's hardly a rarity as far as religious folk tales are concerned, and the Emperor immediately moves to debunk it. He touches the rock and by using his own psychic powers, determines its composition. It appears to be a fairly regular rock, probably unearthed by the landslide following the lightning strike. He also states that he has heard of lightning curing blindness caused by psychological reasons, but rarely in the case of genuine physical illness. He then moves on to suggest that the blind and deaf man wandering the mountains may have imagined the voice in the face of God. 
No. <laughs> uh, ridiculous, right? Imagining the face of God. Oh, how silly. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. The human mind is, as the Emperor points out, quite adept at such things, anthropomorphizing things, and attributing reason and human intent to things that have none. Uriah refuses to hear anything about it and flatly denies the Emperor's interpretation. And when the Emperor asks why, why he cannot even humour the possibility that this may not have been a miracle sent by a god above, Uriah states that he has himself seen God, and therefore he knows that God exists. And as for the rest of us, well, we are just going to have to take that one on faith, aren't we? <laughs> Again, hardly a rarity. Big E continues to rail Uriah on this point for a little bit, and um, Uriah's response is basically just, I am offended, and uh, please respect my holy book. So we'll skip over that part and instead go on to why Uriah believes God is real, and the incident in which he claims to have seen the divine himself. In his youth, Uriah had apparently been quite a rogue. Despite being raised in wealth and plenty, or perhaps because of it, he had a rebellious soul and went to travel the earth. He was, however, dismayed that everywhere he went, the people praised the emperor and swore allegiance to him. In Uriah's view, they had merely exchanged one tyrant for another, and he thought their praise hollow. Interestingly, however, from his description, it sounds like the land was prospering and peaceful. He mentions booming industry, for example, and the fact that a spoiled young lad could travel in comfort and, as Uriah put it, drink and whore his way. <laughs> I mean, that does suggest that uh, the land was in a pretty good state, doesn't it? He even recounts one encounter where he decided to antagonize a group of Thunder Warriors. Oh yeah, now this, this is a brilliant idea, because the Thunder Warriors are famed for their level-headed nature. <laughs> and even then, the worst thing that happened was that one of them got a little bit fed up with him and tossed him into a nearby lake. <sighs> Doesn't exactly sound like a tyrannical dystopia, does it? Eventually, Uriah gave up on his adventuring and returned home for a brief spell before setting his sight once again on Francia, where what I suppose we should describe as a demagogue was raising an army in rebellion. The man in question, Havelek, had assaulted and murdered the local governess, and was to be executed for this crime. But a botched rescue attempt saw some of the local populace killed by the army garrison, and this in turn caused a full-scale uprising. By the time Uriah arrived, several more villagers had joined in, slaughtering their own army garrison forces and rallying to Havelek's banner. Now, Uriah, at the point in time, did not know that the guy had actually killed the governess. The story he had heard was that he had been falsely accused and was to be put to death by the evil tyrant emperor and so on. And this was, of course, in Uriah's, and I would be so generous as to say, the minds of most of those involved, a genuine liberation, a quest for freedom and all of that nonsense. It's unsurprising they would happen in France. The French have always been a little bit overly fond of revolutions. Albeit, uh, when they've tried them, they haven't always worked out all that well. How many governments did France have during the revolutionary period again? A lot. Let's just leave it at that. Anywho... This revolutionary army then heard news of the Thunder Warriors approaching, and a force apparent of some 50,000 men marched out to meet the Thunder Warriors in open battle. Which ended predictably. <laughs> like a fish in a cat food factory, the rebels' faith was sealed and their army utterly annihilated. 
It was during the rout, near fatally wounded, exhausted and confused, that Uriah saw God, a luminous being that asked him, why do you deny me? Yeah, that sounds familiar too. <laughs> We'll, uh, we'll leave that particular unveiling for a little bit later, eh? The Emperor sits there and hears out this story and um, doesn't say anything. <laughs> I think this would have been the perfect time, but oh well, details. And instead, after hearing the story to completion, he tries to convince Uriah. He tries to convince him of the uh, excesses and the evils of religion. He brings up the Mayans, for example, and their um, oft excessive fondness for copious quantities of human vita. This, of course, outrages Uriah, who states immediately that his religion cannot possibly be compared to such barbarism. Well, to be fair, he does have a point there, I suppose. It is a little bit apples and oranges, is it not? Because the Emperor then responds in a way that suggests that Uriah's religion is in some way or form, either a variant of Christianity or perhaps some offshoot branch. The Emperor cites the Crusades, the Inquisition, and the Purge of the Cathars. And again, to be fair to Uriah, the extremity of these actions and the validity of certain quotes like, kill them all, God knows his own, have certainly been brought into a great deal of question during recent history. And like I mentioned in previous points, some of these conflicts were not necessarily motivated purely by religion, and so giving it the sole responsibility seems a bit harsh. Though of course religion was most certainly not blameless in these cases either, the purging of the Cathars in particular. <laughs> That was, um, well, one can certainly argue that it was a power move as well, since the Cathars were moving to threaten the supremacy of the Christianity of the time, but it was also most definitively motivated by uh, religious reasons too. And Uriah's protest that these actions took place long ago and that we know better now is... <laughs> <laughs> it's honestly a little bit laughable. Uh, by all accounts, Terra pre-unification was a war-shattered hellhole, ruled over by crazed cults and brutal techno-barbarians. Not exactly a haven of peace and prosperity. Biggie brings up a certain Cardinal Tang, who apparently thought eugenics sounded like a great idea, and decided to purge all of the unwanted elements from his population via massive death camps. <laughs> oh yes, we have learned so much from our previous mistakes, clearly. It is a sad fact that the lessons of history are not long in the memory of man, unfortunately. Poor Uriah is quite on the back foot here, and eventually it results to the okay, so maybe religion has killed a few million here and there, but think of all of the good things it has done as well. And you know what? I feel like Graham has done a little bit of a bad job presenting the religious argument through a lot of this, and this is one of those points, because Uriah presents this almost like a petulant thing, like, oh yeah, maybe we've done a lot of bad things, but we've done some good things as well, whilst in reality, he is entirely correct. It is true that no matter how horrible a thing may be, some good may come from it, and Christianity is a pretty good example of this, because by and large, whilst it certainly has its dark history, I would probably say that it has been a force for good overall, as it has provided us with a mostly solid framework of morality that has attempted, sometimes successfully and sometimes not so successfully, to both form and keep up with the evolving morality of wider society. Uriah even touches upon this briefly when he essentially asks where humanity is to get its morality from, if not from God. Now this is quite the complex question when you really start to break it down to its component parts, and religion can indeed be quite a useful tool in establishing certain points of morality without going into the whys and the hows. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bone thy neighbour's hot wife. 
These are points of morality we all mostly agree with on a basic level, and it's nice and easy to use religion to just say, well, these are bad things, and you shouldn't do them, to establish them as points of morality, without making us go into deconstruction mode and start asking complicated questions like, for example, thou shalt not kill, even in self-defense, thou shalt not steal, even if you are starving, thou shalt not bang thy neighbor's wife, even if she asks for it and her husband is abusive, etc, etc, etc. There simply is no black and white to almost any situation once you delve deeply enough down into it. And I think the author could have made more of a point for Uriah here, but of course in the end, even if we were to accept that humanity once needed religion to create the basis of our morality, I don't mind you, but for the sake of argument, then surely by now we have passed far beyond that point. Modern day humans are more than able to decide upon their own morality, and has it formed far more so by society at large than religion, hence why Christianity chose to adopt to fit in with modern society, rather than the other way around, which would have been the norm back in the day. The conversation ends when the Emperor reveals himself properly to Uriah, turning himself into the glowy version of the Emperor we all so know and love, showing him again also that the god he saw after that battle was not god at all, but instead the Emperor. Surely, Big E thinks, if, as Uriah said, seeing God was the very fundament of his faith, then this would bring him to reason. Okay, you say you saw God, well, here I am. <laughs> am I God? Oh, logically, this would be true, yes, but logic and religion are not really the best of acquaintances, and so Uriah, after seemingly surrendering for a short period, then reaffirms his belief, his faith, and chooses to die with his church as the Emperor's men set fire to it. And as they leave, the doomsday clock begins to ring. <laughs> oh my, what a shocker, but there is one last point I want to talk about a bit. So, this entire story is it's a little bit of a theological argument, though in many ways not particularly well presented. I, I don't know if Graham McNeil's a religious person, but if it is, if he is, excuse me, then he hasn't spent a great deal of time thinking about this, because Uriah's arguments are not particularly good, and certainly some of it is due to the limitations of religion in and of itself. The entire idea of faith for faith's sake is often one that is quite entrenched in that particular society, but a lot of the points could be made a lot better. And it's not like the Emperor's points were perfect either, he certainly made quite a few mistakes, um, even bringing up things like the, uh, the purging of the Cathars, and then bringing up a quote that in all due likelihood was not actually said by the person in question, but rather invented later on. But it is probably the last argument made that is the most consequential for the entire story. The Emperor explains to Uriah that he wants to build a much greater future for humanity. He wants to reforge humanity's empire amongst the stars and bring it into a golden age. Uriah asks how this is any different from the supposed crimes he accuses religion of, war and hardship. And the Emperor simply says, because I know I am right. Which, of course, is no better than Uriah's argument when he says that he is convinced that God is real because he believes that God is real. And it is such a strange answer as well for Big E to make, because it is the Emperor simply accepting a moral equivalent between a war of faith and religion and one of reason and logic. The Emperor accepts a moral equivalent between these two when, in reality, none really exists. Or perhaps I should say rather than reason and logic, I should say one of necessity, a war of necessity. The Emperor isn't trying to conquer the galaxy based on the words of a mystical old man in the sky, or for some point of oft-rewritten dogma. He's waging a war because of a real and tangible threat, one we know is real. He seeks to destroy chaos and to secure humanity's existence. 
And in a galaxy like 40k, there is no way of doing that other than through military conquest. Even the rule of the Old Ones was practically defined by their war against the Necron tier. The Eldar Empire then subjugated the galaxy, corralling the other species into the outer fringes before being undone by their own hubris. And even the oh so progressive Tau don't hesitate to use military force to enforce their will if they can't get it quickly enough via indoctrination or diplomacy. Hell, even if you were to completely ignore chaos, even then, being a weak, small species in 40k is practically a death sentence. Considering the number of aggressive and predatory species in the galaxy, the Empress Wars are justifiable for many reasons, but the clearest justification of all is one of simple circumstance and survival. In a galaxy of predators, the prey cannot hope to reason with the hunter, and will always be nothing more than food. Much better, then, to be a wolf rather than a sheep, would you not agree? And when we add in the force of chaos, it only makes even more sense. Chaos is an existential threat to life. All of it. Even the knife ears recognize that. And so waging a war to destroy chaos is not merely justifiable, but obviously desirable. And to do so, the destruction of faith and religion is an absolute step. The warp is what we make of it, and if we had the skills of the old Eldar, perhaps we could even shape and control it as they once did. We could potentially fashion gods of our own to fight against the Chaos Gods, like the Eldar still do in the form of the Avatar. But realistically, this is a feat far beyond humanity, and would require an unfathomably authoritarian reign. All humans would have to believe in the exact same thing in the exact same way, or risk toppling the entire pyramid. And any deviancy would have to be stomped out with severe prejudice, lest we repeat the Eldar's mistakes. And we would have to do this with humanity, a far less uniform species than the Eldar. Again, theoretically, it may have been possible to use Chaos against Chaos to form our own gods and weapons in the warp, but this appears to be beyond our capabilities. Few and far between are the tales of humans wielding the weapons of the great enemy against itself with any degree of success, especially not long-term success, and fewer still are the stories when the hero does not eventually turn into the villain at the end, irreversibly corrupted. And while it is indeed possible for humans to potentially resist the lure of chaos, at least for limited periods of time, via, for example, applying what Ibrahim Gaunt dubbed the Armour of Contempt, this is the exception rather than the rule. And knowing all of this, it is far more pragmatic to simply reduce the influence of religion, to make the very idea of gods and demons something ridiculous, a silly superstition to be mocked and derided by the vast majority of humanity. Turn it into such an absolute joke that even if an entire planet was infested by demons and slaughtered by the denizens of the warp, the rest of the galaxy would simply laugh at the rumors. <laughs> Invaded by demons? Are you crazy? Oh, you'll have to go further out in the fringes with that story, my son. And this is a weapon that can be wielded with great ease by humanity directly against the demons. And this requires very little direct control. As we see within the Imperium, a religion isn't even illegal or banned. There are several characters in the Horus Heresy that have various faiths and even carry symbols of that faith openly. It is only organized worship that is forbidden, and this still allows people to believe in religion if they so choose to. But these people will naturally be marginalized members of society. They will be mocked, and they will be uh, derided for their faith. They will also be unable to organize, and therefore they will almost certainly slowly but surely die out in ever smaller and more isolated communities. No need for any more overt usage of force or thought policing. We can even see this in modern day society, where religion in the modern world is becoming rarer and rarer and rarer, and what religious fervor still exists most of the time comes from outside of the West. 
And this is not a result of some large-scale crackdown upon religious practices, it is simply the result of more and more people finding the very idea of a man in the sky faintly ridiculous. I see no reason why we could not replicate that in the 41st millennium, and we know it is effective because the Chaos Gods themselves have told us this. They have actually explained to us that what the Emperor is doing is effective, and that they are afraid. That is why they have put in place this massive Hail Mary plan that relies upon a billion little circumstances, a billion little coincidences to go just right. That they have put all of their considerable efforts and power into pulling this off. They are clearly on the back foot in this. and. Another point as well, on the point that only emotions and not faith is what gives the Chaos Gods their power. This is an argument I have seen repeated occasionally, and it is obvious nonsense. The Chaos Gods encourage worship at every turn, and insert themselves into legends and myths as holy figures or gods. Colchis, for example, has its story of Karna, Dizen, Slanat, and Narag. Chaos also uses rituals, covens, priests, and temples. Chaos drapes itself liberally and all of the paraphernalia of religion, even the Eldar, who once came the closest to truly controlling the warp, crafted their creations in the guise of gods. Isha, Cain, Kernas, Vol. This is not all some cosmic coincidence that all of the Chaos powers style themselves as gods. They demand worship, they demand temples, covens, recruit priests and prophets. And to use an old tried and tested saying, if it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, and looks like a duck, odds are pretty damn good that it is in fact a duck and not a space shuttle. Furthermore, we can even look at the Chaos Gods themselves. Corn is not merely anger or hatred or a lust for bloodshed. Corn is a specific entity. He has a way of doing things. He has likes and he has dislikes. He forms his servants in particular ways. He has his skull rune, a clear insignia of corn. His servants carry it. They wage his wars, often against the other chaos powers. Zinch demands that his followers be devious, manipulative, and planning. Nurgle demands worship through disease, the spread of it, and that they be jolly in their despair. All of these things are not merely just emotions, they are not two-dimensional entities, they very much so are fully formed characters in their own right, even though their view of the world, their rationale, their very existence is far beyond our human understanding. A closer example to this would be one given in the Liber Chaotica, one which I am particularly fond of, which shows us that it is the belief and not the merest emotion that creates these creatures. The Liber Chaotica gives us an example of curdled milk. In a village, a farmer notices that his milk is beginning to change. It has started to form clumps. It has begun to curdle. Now, we know why this happens, we know the scientific reasoning. This is a phenomenon that happens to milk when its pH values drop enough to allow the protein molecules in milk to clump together. Fairly simple. But ancient humanity would of course not know this. The first time a farmer saw milk curdle, he'd have no bloody idea what's going on. He'd have no inkling that this is due to the protein structure of the milk. And so he would come up with an explanation for why this happened. Indeed, explaining the unexplainable has been one of the key points of religion throughout human history. Why does the sun rise in the morning? Well, it's because it's the chariot of a god. Why does the moon rise? Well, you see, that's another chariot chasing the first one, and so on and so on. And in the case given in the Liber Chaotica, the village then believes that, okay, well, the milk curdles because it is the will of some divine entity. It happens for a divine reason, or it is a part of some kind of plot or plan, some after effects of the actions of the gods, for surely that is the only explanation. And as this faith starts 
on a faith, this belief, perhaps more accurately, starts gaining more traction, it becomes the accepted idea for why milk curdle. This then forms an entity in the warp, a minor demon with virtually no power, whose sole purpose is to curdle milk. That is what it does, because that is what humanity thinks causes the curdling of the milk. And so the warp reacts to human belief and goes, okay, well, okay, that's, uh, that's how that works then. And the minor entity, depending then upon the amount of power it can eventually garner, will gain power. Now, in the case of a creature like this, whose sole purpose is the curdling of milk, it is unlikely to ever gain any degree of sentience or intelligence. It will simply be a thing in the warp that curdles milk in a specific fashion in this particular area, and that is it. But it is a perfect example, and a hard example, a black and white one, on the fact that faith does indeed have an effect upon the warp. It is not merely emotions. Hell, another perfect example, of course, is the orcs. The orcs don't, they don't have an emotion that makes red trucks go faster. They believe red trucks go faster, and ergo, red truck go faster. The value of faith to chaos entities has been very thoroughly and properly established in 40k. But I wanted somewhat off the point here, let's wrap it up. The Emperor's idea of conquering the galaxy in order to eradicate chaos is absolutely the right move for him to make because it is pretty much his only truly reliable option. It is the one that he can achieve the easiest, and that should tell you something. Is co if conquering the galaxy is the simplest solution, <laughs> it is quite the problem that the Emperor has put for himself here. Using faith as a weapon against the Chaos Gods, again, theoretically, yeah, it absolutely could work, but in all due likelihood, practically, no. It is not really an option. If the Eldar couldn't do it, we sure as hell cannot do it. And then we go to the, the value of religion as well. I feel as if this short story tries a little bit too hard to debunk religion, to try and go like, oh, religion is inherently not really worth anything, which is why Uriah gets such piss-poor points a lot of the time, and I don't agree. I absolutely do think that religion does have its values, absolutely, and people should be free to believe in whatever they want. <laughs> Luckily, in our world, the Chaos Gods don't exist. <sighs> Looks around nervously. <clears throat> And so we have that liberty. And it's not all bad. You know, you can certainly say that religion has caused some shit over the years, and it absolutely has. And some religions are absolutely a hell of a lot worse than others. Hint, hint. However, again, nothing is purely evil and nothing is purely good. Religion has its good points. Religion has its bad points. Hell. <laughs> I am not a big fan of Islam, but I can recognize that even Islam has good points. Having charity as a virtue, for example, is absolutely a good thing. Shame about that whole uh, war on everything and everyone that isn't a Muslim part, but you know, nothing's perfect, I suppose. And Uriah actually makes another point previously on as well, that the Emperor basically, um, he puts it like this. There you go again, you're just picking and choosing the parts of the text that you wish to um, actually listen to. And Uriah's point there is, like, Emperor goes, hey, these texts are often horrible. If you read these holy books, literally, it's fucking disgusting. It is crazy. It is the most insane shit ever. And Uriah goes, oh, it's allegoric. You're not supposed to take it literally. No, when it was written, it probably was meant to be taken literally a lot of it. But again, our modern interpretation of this has evolved. Christianity is an excellent example of a religion that has seen the world change around it and made an effort to actually stay relevant by changing his own morality. It changes the meaning of certain uh, passages. The Old Testament in particular is uh, an interesting read. Let's just say that um, God had quite the face change from those two particular editions. And of course, the holy books are also rewritten quite frequently. The Bible we have today is a far fucking cry from the original version of it. And interpreting these holy books in a way that suits your current sensibilities 
Uh, to a degree, I would argue that yes, it is in fact hypocritical uh, to then go like, oh, religion is good. Look, if you read it to this and this and this way, it's wonderful. Yeah, it, it is. But it is also not a bad thing. In fact, it is a good thing. Look upon our modern day society, where we have all religions existing side by side most of the time, heavy emphasis on most, peacefully, in large part because everyone in the West at least basically agrees that okay, let's just ignore the more um, violent parts of our respective holy books and instead focus on the fluffy, happy-go-lucky, lovely parts. And there's nothing wrong with that. Religion has its place even in modern society, whether or not it will have one in the future, I don't know. I don't think anyone really knows. It might have a much larger role to play, it might have a much smaller role to play. But again, we are wandering somewhat off the topic of the last church. In conclusion, I think this is a interesting book that is somewhat ham- oh, book, short story- that is somewhat ham-fisted about the points that it is trying to present, but at the end of the day, it has succeeded in the biggest, most important point of a short story like this, which is, of course, making the reader think about the arguments, the propositions, the suppositions, and the presentation that is within it. If nothing else, this 50-minute-odd uh, video should serve as a fairly unrefutable testament to that. Now, I am sure many of you have your own uh, passionate opinions on this work, so please do go ahead and leave them down in the comments section below. I am sure this could actually spark some rather interesting discussions. And... Uh, until next time, I've been Arch, thank you all very much for listening, and I hope to see you all again soon. And also, don't forget to check out the Kickstarter that I've linked in the description down below if you think that an animated version of The Last Church would be interesting. Have a good day.